Hi, I'm Bob Newport. This is the first of a series of videos that I'm going to record primarily for the local branch of my um, U3A, the University of the Third Age. Uh, but it's going on to YouTube, so of course anyone is welcome to watch. There's a blog post that goes with this, and uh, within that there are a lot of um, links that you can follow if you want further information. And all of those details will be um, provided as we go through. So, let's get started. Well, here's our title slide. Uh, and as you can see, it concerns um, where we are in the grand scheme of things. Um, so this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, containing about 200 million stars, thereabouts, uh, and all the planetary systems that go with them. And within this galaxy, we sit here. This is our solar system, this is our sun, uh, and the, the uh, planets that go around it. And some of the things labelled on here you'll, um, you'll be familiar with, you'll have seen before. So Polaris, for instance, is labelled uh, here, quite close to us on this scale. And there are various other things that you might recognise on here as well. But the only thing we're concerned about is this little region here. I'll set some background to all this as we go through, and hopefully I'll unravel for you uh, what makes um, what makes the Earth a little bit special in the context even of all of this. So this is me. Uh, what you see at the top there is the um, URL for the blog post that I mentioned earlier. So this is uh, going to provide you all the backup information to go with this video. Um, and more generally, if you want to explore um, the um, the blog has got posts about all sorts of science related stuff that's up to you. You can find me on Twitter as well and directly on YouTube if you want to have a look at some of the other things I've uploaded uh, over the years. Uh, and this is my residual profile uh, from my old um, university department at the University of Kent. Um, and you'll see that I've acknowledged them as well as the U3A down at the bottom and that's because I'm very grateful that they um, continue to let me use bits and pieces uh, for my various talks over the years. So what are we going to look at? We're going to start with um, how the Earth came to be. So how do solar systems form? Um, and ours in particular. And we're going to look at things like uh, the age, the size, the mass, speeds. I'm going to focus at one point very much on the Earth-Moon system. Our Moon, it turns out, is extraordinarily um, special in relation to us uh, and really quite important um, for keeping us going in the way that we are. Water is um, absolutely essential for life as we know it. Uh, so getting our planet into something that's called the Goldilocks zone, uh, the just right zone, turns out to be quite important. It's self-evidently important, in fact, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that actually means uh, in real terms. Uh, we're going to look at how we are protected from some of the things that would do us harm. Uh, we have on the Earth, we're very fortunate to have um, a well-developed magnetic field and that turns out to be extremely useful. Because of our makeup, we also have a series of tectonic plates. Our solid crust is actually a jigsaw of pieces that move around uh, by virtue of the convection currents in the molten material underneath the magma. And actually that turns out to be fairly special and vital for life as well. So we'll end up, I hope, with this view that the Earth is a dynamic place, but it's a dynamic place within an overall framework uh, of parameters that is quite stable. 
So we balance, we balance in this delicate place between um, uh, having dynamism and being stable, both of which turn out to be really quite useful. And we'll sum it up uh, as we go towards the end. Feedback and discussion, given that this is going to be a video based session, uh, will be confined to um, follow up through something like Zoom. Uh, so um, local, our local coordinator will be in touch at some stage uh, to give you the details of that. So again, back to our title slide image. Uh, this is our galaxy, the Milky Way. And as um, this sort of Python-esque finger is showing us, uh, we sit uh, in what is one of the spiral arms uh, of our galaxy. And we have quite a nice location here. This is, for want of a better description, a quiet suburb of our galaxy. It's actually a long, long way away from the uh, massive black hole at the centre uh, of our galaxy around which the whole thing revolves. This is a common feature uh, in galaxies. In fact, there are theories um, to suggest that galaxies um, form around black holes. Um, so they're not to be feared in that sense, but we don't want to get too close. Well, let's zero in again and, you know, our fingers come in just in case you can't read the fact that this is the Earth depicted here. Uh, the distance scales on here are entirely arbitrary. They're just drawn so as to fit things on the screen. Um, the differential in sizes between these planets is a teeny bit more realistic. Um, and accordingly, you can see that we are, as you know, the third one out from the Sun, Mercury, Venus and then us. And we have with us a single moon, one moon beyond us, Mars, uh, and then a belt of asteroids, uh, mostly very small. Some of them like Ceres depicted here, uh, a little bit larger. And then we get to planets that are called the gas giants. So we're out to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and um, Neptune. And beyond them, again, another belt of icy and or rocky bodies, small things that um, orbit around the sun at huge distance out here. One of which is Pluto, something we used to uh, see listed in books as a planet. It's now referred to as a minor planet, uh, along with um, objects like Aries and, and Make Make, and there are actually a few others uh, out there as well. And out of this and out of something that I'll show you later on on the next slide, this thing called the Oort cloud, uh, we get comets coming in and um, periodically going around the sun and back out again in huge and really quite accentuated elliptical orbits. But let's have another look at our solar system with a different eye to distance scales. And the distance scales here are actually uh, defined according to something called an astronomical unit. And the astronomical unit is essentially just the distance, the average distance between the Sun and the Earth. Now that turns out to be about 150 million kilometres. So that's one astronomical unit. It's just a lot easier to talk in terms of astronomical units than keep listing millions of um, kilometres. So here we are at one. And this scale, for those of you who um, appreciate logarithmic scales, uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So every uh, unit of length along this scale is actually a factor of 10 in distance. So what this is telling us is that Saturn is about 10 times further away from the Sun as the Earth. It's something like 10 astronomical units. So this is 150 uh, million kilometres. Um, Saturn therefore is at one and a half billion kilometres. Near enough. And then we have Uranus and Neptune even further out. And actually we have to go another factor of 10. So we have to go 
to about 100 astronomical units before we get to this region around here, uh, which marks out the extent really of the sun's uh, uh, influence in terms of the solar wind and so on. So the particles that come off the sun get out to this sort of distance before they come up against um, radiation in the cosmos in general, so galactic radiation as it were. And you get something a little bit like a bow wave out here, a shock wave. Um, and that usually then that barrier is referred to as the heliopause. It's the point at which Helios, the sun, uh, and the, and the um, solar wind coming from it actually comes up against uh, interstellar space proper, as it were. But the sun's gravitational pull doesn't stop there. Um, so although between Mars and Jupiter, you'll remember on the previous slide, there's a whole ring of um, icy and rocky bodies uh, that we refer to as the um, as the asteroids. Uh, we have then beyond Neptune, remember the Kuiper belt, another body of, of icy boulders and so on. Um, we go further out still, so now we're out to somewhere in the region, it's a very broad uh, thing this, but we're out to somewhere in the region of 10,000 astronomical units we have the Oort cloud uh, and the Oort cloud is another collection of small uh, icy and, uh, and rocky bodies that are orbiting the Sun um, in, its, um, in its ecliptic disk, the layer that all things seem to exist upon, um, way way out here. And we can get bodies coming in from the Oort cloud like comets and so on on occasion uh, and looping around the sun and coming back out again. Uh, and they can take centuries, sometimes thousands of years uh, to make one orbit. And we have to go up now more than another factor of 10 in distance before we get to our nearest star uh, at Alpha Centauri. So you can see the distance scales are enormous associated with our um, solar system uh, but perhaps the thing the things that we tend to look at most think about most uh, is everything in this sort of region here out to about a hundred uh, astronomical units I've marked a position of Voyager 1 on here in fact Voyager 1 got to this point the heliopause in about 2012 it's a slightly fuzzy transition that it made but this is the point at which it began detecting the cosmic magnetic fields rather than being dominated by the Sun's magnetic field. So even having left Earth in the late 1970s, it took until 2012, travelling at prodigious speeds uh, to have um, got out to the um, uh, the discernible edge of our solar system. So we're talking about a very big bubble in space. Uh, some background figures to all this stuff, the speed that Voyager's travelling at and all that sort of thing uh, are in the um, blog post or the links therein. So you can go and look this stuff if you, if you want to. I just don't want to bombard you with too many facts and figures. There are going to be quite enough of those as it is. So we're on to formation um, and um, key in this process uh, is the fact that uh, all the bodies apparently uh, in our galaxy and in the universe as a whole uh, have a tendency to rotate. Uh, it's not um, a tricky thing to imagine uh, but it does appear to be universal. Uh, you can think of it, if you like, um, as water flowing out of a bath. No matter how still the water might look when you first pull the plug up, as the level goes down, you'll notice rotation around the plug hole, uh, which turns into a bit of a whirlpool uh, in the last moments of the bath uh, emptying out. And actually that's caused by just tiny instabilities in the water 
as you pull the plug up uh, and it doesn't take much and eventually that turns into a rotation uh, of the whole body and we see that throughout the universe. So rotation is going to be a key thing uh, but we're going to need accretion and aggregation. We're going to need things to come together to form the higher density regions of space that we um, eventually look at and term a star or a planetary system. And I got involved um, two or three years ago, uh, very briefly, just for one summer period as a stand-in, uh, with helping to run the Beacon Observatory at the University of Kent. And the research programme there is very much focused on the early stages of um, planetary system development. So I got to spend a summer, this was I think a year, maybe two years after I retired, um, sitting up all night watching and steering and guiding uh, this particular telescope gathering uh, these images. And this is just a screenshot uh, from my, um, uh, my PC at home, which is thankfully where I was able to control this thing. Uh, and one of the star fields that I was charged with looking at. And the interesting bit, although you can't really see it on this uh, uh, monochrome screen image, is this fuzzy stuff. And this fuzzy stuff actually turns out to be gas and dust clouds, enormous gas and dust clouds um, out there in space, out of which we get the formation of stars uh, and associated planetary systems. So more of that later. These are colour images uh, of the things that I was uh, looking at over that summer. And it's easier to pick out now these huge dust clouds. Uh, this is the one we had in the black and white image earlier on, for instance. And it's very easy to see now that there is, um, there is dust around it. And actually this green colour is um, often characteristic of oxygen being present. So that's quite interesting in its own right. Uh, here's another one over here. Less easy to see on this one. But the key thing is it is out of this material and this material extends over millions and millions of kilometres in space uh, that stars um, coalesce or the material coalesces, forms a star uh, and we get planetary systems around them. So rotation was a key word, you'll remember, in uh, my introduction. This is, a, um, this is a view from a webcam. It's a particularly high definition webcam, but it's a webcam nevertheless pointing directly upwards from the observatory uh, that I was talking about earlier. And you can see things rotating uh, in the sky above. Uh, those of you who, um, uh, who know the area, uh, this is the Canterbury Whitstable Road around here. So you can see the lights from passing uh, traffic. There's a few house lights uh, from, the, um, from Blean, uh, a suburb of Canterbury showing up here. Uh, and you can see the moon coming up uh, and going round on here. You can also see the effects of pointing a webcam upwards and getting um, getting birds adding their calling cards but that's unavoidable the key thing is that this shows us rotating uh, underneath the heavens you can also get a bit of a glimpse of um, uh, the milky way a view towards the middle of our galaxy which shows up uh, and rotates around um, um, or apparently rotates around over our heads. It's actually us rotating under it. So rotation turns out to be ubiquitous. So this is an artist's impression of the early stages of the formation of a planetary system. We have these dust and gas particles that have at some point begun to produce a higher density region. It doesn't take much. Again, it's just like the bathwater. One little instability uh, in the distribution and um, we start getting things beginning to clump together. And once there's a bit of a clump, then 
the gravitational attraction of that area becomes a little bit greater than elsewhere and more things begin to come in. They essentially fall uh, into this gravitational attraction. And if that goes on long enough, uh, we get something uh, that is massive enough and compresses itself under its own gravitational pull enough uh, for nuclear reactions to begin. So in the case of our sun, for instance, uh, hydrogen, which was the principal gaseous component uh, of the material from which uh, it came, um, begins to undergo nuclear fusion to become helium and in the process uh, emits enormous amounts of energy in the form of light and, um, and energetic particles and so on. So that's fine as far as it goes, uh, but of course there's still a lot of this gaseous and dust type particles uh, left over in the vicinity and they're still just rotating around and around and they will continue to fall into uh, this um, early years star uh, in the centre here um, and they'll do that either steadily or in clumps if there's a, a slightly thicker area that falls in uh, then the star will change its brightness as this additional material arrives and actually that process is at the heart of a lot of the observations being made uh, in the um, observatory that I was volunteering at. Now that happens until we start getting planets or protoplanets forming and all these are are just local irregularities in the density of material. So we get uh, a lump of something that's slightly again more massive than its surroundings and this too will begin to draw material in from its vicinity. So we've got one over here, we've got another one shown in this artist's impression uh, over here. And the important thing is that once these begin to rotate around the star, they'll actually mop up the material that is still slowly falling towards that star. So the star ceases to gather a lot more uh, mass once these things begin to form they will trap it on its way in. It will never make it as far um, as the star, um, you know, beyond their orbits. And this is the sort of the way, sort of way that the Earth and all the other planets in our solar system uh, will have uh, initially formed. They will just be gatherings of um, bits and pieces in this leftover bit of material after the star has begun. Now, interestingly, they have to uh, have started forming within just a few million years uh, of the star um, initiating its fusion process, beginning to shine, in other words. And that's simply because um, the star then starts emitting energetic particles. It starts emitting uh, what we tend to refer to as solar wind uh, and actually that and just the pressure of the light being emitted will tend to blow away all of this smaller material uh, left on the outside. So unless planets start to form within that quite brief window, uh, they may not form at all. So although that's a fairly crude delineation, it already separates out the Earth and our solar system uh, as being relatively special. So let's move on to the next bit. Okay, this is one of this is one of my images through my telescope. Um, it's been doctored a little bit. So this bit in the middle, there's Jupiter, um, actually south at the top in this image because of the type of telescope I used. Uh, that box I've sort of left alone, but I've taken up the brightness level of, of the rest of the plate and I've done that so that we can pick out three uh, of Jupiter's many moons. These are three of the four so-called Galilean moons uh, because Galileo using his telescope actually managed to spot uh, four of the moons. Uh, 
uh, there's another one a bit further out that I didn't capture in this frame. So I've got Io, Europa and Ganymede. And one of the first things to notice is that we could draw a line between these, the centre of Jupiter, and they would all be sitting on that line. Um, the other thing is that if we look at this over a period of days, weeks, months, even years, uh, we will see that these moons um, change position. And they change position in a way that really can only be explained on the basis of them, <coughs> excuse me, orbiting Jupiter itself. In fact, Io has a period of only about two days, so it doesn't take long uh, to see this apparently moving inwards and then back out the other side again and so on as it rotates around. Uh, and on one of its passes, of course, we'll be able to see it cast a shadow on Jupiter uh, and as it goes back behind, we'll not see that. It's a pretty good indication that we're looking at something rotating. So even within our solar system, we've got something that acts in a way like a model for the solar system itself. That things are rotating, they are orbiting one another. And of course Jupiter orbits the Sun uh, in its turn. And these things, these moons, will have formed in exactly the same way as Jupiter itself. So they'll just be bits of that early disk of leftover material from the star formation that have clumped together and in their case haven't gone on to form unique planets but have actually been captured uh, by the gravitational attraction of Jupiter uh, which obviously formed uh, itself big enough, fast enough uh, to have dominated in terms of the local uh, gravitational um, attractions. Now this is very recent, this is actually happening pretty much as I'm recording this uh, video almost. Uh, this is uh, part of the asteroid belt, in fact it's a little closer to the Earth than, than most of the asteroid belt, which means it was vaguely possible for NASA to contemplate sending a probe out there, uh, which it has done, this thing called OSIRIS-REx, uh, to collect some of its material. But the interesting thing from our point of view is that you can see immediately that it's just made up of bits and pieces. It's just an aggregation uh, of um, rocks and small particles. And the rocks themselves would have been formed from smaller dust particles uh, originally. And they're held together quite weakly uh, because this thing isn't very big. I mean, if we go top to bottom, think in terms of the height of the Shard in London, and you've got, you know, roughly the sort of um, uh, scale that we're talking about. So it's big, but it's not that big. And in fact, this thing is itself rotating and it's rotating fast enough that occasionally some of these boulders and rocks get flung off into space, a bit like a spin dryer, I suppose. Uh, but this uh, repeated um, view here is actually showing uh, an arm that is going to come right down to the surface of this, this asteroid called Bennu. It's going to puff some nitrogen gas out, which will disturb the fine material on the surface, uh, which NASA hopes then to collect and bring back to Earth. It's not due back with us until 2023, so we've got a bit of a wait. But I put it in simply because it gives us, as I say, this, uh, this impression, this feeling uh, for what it might have looked like um, in the early days of Earth's formation. We would have started as this sort of thing, an aggregation of, of bits and pieces, um, which would have gathered more and more and more until its own gravitational um, field was strong enough that it pulled things in, compressed things into a sphere uh, and, um, and we got the planet that we know and love uh, today. Um, if you haven't spotted it at the top, uh, these are some distance scales. So this picture was taken from about 24 kilometres away. Uh, this one, um, as the probe descended to within about 
40 meters of the surface. It was, this is actually a, a practice run, a dummy run, before they actually um, had their first attempt at, um, at grabbing some material, as it were, ready to fly home. So this is quite a nice shot, I think, um, and an astonishing achievement, I have to say, to have got all the way out beyond Mars to something that's not much bigger than the shard um, and to accurately come down to its surface and think about collecting material and then bringing it back to Earth again. Tremendous achievement. But let's have a look at some of our facts and figures. Uh, and these are actually going to set the agenda, I suppose, for the, for the rest of the talk. Because what I'm going to be doing is working through this list and expanding out their significance uh, bit by bit. So we start with the fact that our solar system is quite young. Our sun is quite young. It's only about four and a half billion years old. Uh, you'll see it written down in some places as giga years. I've, I'm going to stick by and large to billion because I think we all understand that. A thousand million, right? Um, now that turns out to be important um, for explaining how we're made up what elements of the periodic table we have available to us. And we'll get to that later on as well. This line, some of you will recall uh, from the musical Hair way back um, in um, the glory days of our youth, um, turns out actually to be quite an auspicious statement in this context. So after four and a half billion years, our sun is roughly middle-aged. Uh, it's probably got a little more than four and a half billion years to go before we start getting big changes. Um, it's a main sequence star, middle of the road, in other words. Um, and um, it's very stable because of all that. Uh, and it's been stable for at least the last four billion years. The initial phase, as I've described earlier, includes uh, gathering more material to itself, it, its brightness changes in the process, etc, etc. So we need to get all that over and then it becomes uh, quite stable. And it turns out that almost all the mass of the solar system is the sun. It's 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the solar system. All of the planets, all of the asteroids, all of it uh, counts for only 0.1% of the mass of the solar system. We are dominated uh, by the sun. Uh, so its gravity rules all, and that's, that's important. Um, not only do we have a middle-aged, um, stable sun, but our sun is actually in a, as I've said before, a relatively quiet suburb of our Milky Way. No nasty black holes in our vicinity, nothing horrendous uh, that's going to disrupt what we're doing. Actually more than that, and in a more general term than that, the sun is on its own. A lot of the stars in the Milky Way are actually part of binary or even triplet systems. Two or three stars uh, rotating around one another. And actually that is anything but stable. That actually creates um, a very complex um, gravitational makeup. Uh, and it's very hard, I think, to envisage um, st stable um, life supporting planets in that sort of system. There's just too much going on, too many pushes and pulls from different stars. So we're fortunate, actually, that we're, we're on our own. Um, now, we also turn out to be a rocky planet. We are um, quite fortunate from that point of view. We've got somewhere to stand, basically. Um, but we've got a molten core. We have magma down there underneath our feet. Uh, and that's important also, as I'll try and sort of draw out. We've got an almost perfectly circular orbit. It is an ellipse, but it's only just an ellipse. 
Uh, and I've already mentioned that we're about um, uh, 150 million um, kilometers away, so 150 billion meters, as it says here. And you'll know as well as I do that it takes about 365 and a quarter days for the Earth to go around the sun one time. It's not precisely that, but it's almost that. And of course, the quarter is what explains our need for leap years to keep our calendars in sync. Uh, we've got a fairly decent radius, so a little over 6,000 kilometres at the equator. That's important, of course. The Earth is spinning, remember, like everything else. Uh, and um, again, think of a spin dryer in your washing machine. The Earth is spinning, so it tends actually to fling itself out, fatten itself at the equator at the expense of the poles. So they tend to come in, the equator tends to come out a little bit. So we're not perfectly spherical. We're, we're nearly spherical, but not perfectly. Um, and we've got a big mass, uh, a big enough mass to do what we need it to do. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. And of course, if we've got a radius and a mass, we can also work out the density of the Earth. And even that turns out to be um, uh, just right for life as, as we understand it. We have a magnetic field. I've alluded to that earlier, and I'm going to come back to it. And we have a large moon. In fact, it's the fifth largest moon in the, um, in the solar system. Um, and it actually holds the record uh, in um, a very important sense that I'll tell you about later on. So let's begin pulling out additional information from that outline. I've said that our solar system is about four and a half billion years old. Now that means given that the universe as a whole is about 14 billion years old, uh, that there have been generations of stars coming and going before our sun came into existence. Now what happens with, with stars is that they go into this phase of, of nuclear reaction, so converting hydrogen to helium, uh, and that progresses to heavier elements in the periodic table as, as we go through. But eventually that process stops there is, uh, you know, there's no more fuel. And if the star is big enough beyond a sort of certain critical size, it doesn't fizzle out, it explodes. We get something that's called a supernova. Now that's important and it's important because um, for a star like ours, uh, this set of nuclear processes within it is only energetic enough to create elements in the periodic table up to about iron, right? which is a little more than halfway through, but it would stop there. There's, there's simply not enough energy to go beyond that. But in a supernova there is. Prodigious amounts of energy are released and actually all of the other naturally occurring elements, all the way out to 92 uranium, um, are generated within these highly energetic uh, supernova events. So if we imagine, you know, roughly 10 billion years thereabouts uh, as the lifetime of our star um, before it explodes, we've had several of those events, so generations of events uh, happening within our galaxy before we came along. So in other words, the gas and dust cloud from which our star came, our sun, uh, included within it all these heavier elements that have been distributed through the Milky Way by earlier generations of um, exploding stars, energetic solar events. So everything all the way through silver, gold, you know, whatever, all the way out to um, uranium, as I say, uh, were generated by um, processes associated with former generations of stars uh, who, you know, went through a, a death process uh, and 
bequeathed to us, uh, later generations of stars, um, all of these wonderful heavy elements. We would have none of that on the Earth had we not been formed as late in the life of the universe as we have been. So as that old song said, we really are made of stardust um, and gold wouldn't be here on the Earth had it not been formed uh, from these earlier generations of stars. So we're quite fortunate from that point of view uh, itself. Now, it's very stable. Um, in fact, our sun is um, more stable even than a great many of other stars in its, uh, um, um, in its sequence. So stars very similar to our sun uh, are apparently a little bit less stable. Um, and we can trace back through uh, really quite detailed records for a few thousand years and see that the sun hasn't changed by more than a tiny fraction of 1% uh, in that period. And if we look geologically at the makeup of the isotopes in the rocks uh, that form the Earth, uh, we can see that that's been the case for at least the last 90,000 years. Uh, and all the indications are that it's been really exceptionally stable um, way back uh, before that. And our anticipation is that we've probably got another four or five billion years uh, of this stability uh, before things start getting um, uh, a little bit messy. But, you know, that's not going to worry us too much. So that's important in itself. But now we're going to zero in a little bit more on, on the Earth. So I've made the point that it's a rocky planet, uh, that it's got a molten core. Um, because the Sun uh, dominates in terms of the mass and therefore the gravitational attractions within the solar system, the Earth goes around in this nearly circular orbit. And in fact, there's only about 3% difference um, between um, its closest approach and uh, furthest distance uh, from the average. So it goes from about 147 million kilometers to about 152, I think, uh, kilometers from the sun. So as a proportion, really very small. And that's good because that means that wherever we are in our orbit around the sun, uh, because we're at roughly the same distance, we are getting from the sun as a planet pretty much the same amount of energy uh, on a day by day basis. It doesn't vary a lot. If we were on a very eccentric orbit, in an extreme, let's talk about one of these comets that goes way out, um, you know, beyond uh, beyond the planets um, and loops back in then close to the sun before flinging itself back out there again, you'll know there's a huge change. It's completely frozen uh, and inert when it's far away from the sun. As it gets towards the sun, it gets heated up, uh, water and other things, as in its makeup begin to vaporize and we get the cometary tail um, you know that becomes so synonymous uh, with images of comets that we see huge variation we avoid all of that because we're in this nearly circular orbit uh, around um, around the sun now the fact that we have this substantial mass is important because it gives us enough uh, gravitational attraction to hang on to our atmosphere and that's of self-evident uh, importance. This um, image down here was taken from the International Space Station. Uh, forgive me, I can't remember which astronaut took it, but you can see this is at sunrise, so it shows up really nicely. You can see that our atmosphere is a, a very delicate, thin shell. Uh, around the planet itself. Um, 
it's it's vital, but it is fragile um, and small, and we're losing it. We're losing it into space, um, second by second. Uh, there are molecules of gas in our atmosphere that have enough energy um, near the um, uh, near the top of the atmosphere to be able to escape from the Earth altogether. But thankfully, we've got enough mass to hang on to it by and large, and the loss is at such a a small percentage of the total um, that it will uh, the atmosphere will long outlive us before there's any uh, noticeable um, thinning. Now that's not the case with lighter planets. So Mars, for instance, much smaller than the Earth, um, simply didn't have enough gravitational attraction to hang on to it. So Mars has uh, a very, very thin atmosphere around it, um, mostly as a result, as I say, of its, of its lower mass. There, there's another reason as well, but we'll come to that later on. So that's quite important. Um, and in passing, I think I, I ought to just mention um, the greenhouse effect in the context with our atmosphere, uh, because we do need some. Uh, we've always had some greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, that sort of thing, uh, in our atmosphere. Um, and it's a good thing uh, at that level because it keeps us a little bit warmer at ground level than we would be without it. So if there were no greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, the average temperature on the Earth would be something like minus 18 degrees centigrade, which is about where you keep your freezer, for instance. So that's not terribly conducive to um, either life beginning or certainly being able to sustain itself. So we need a little bit. Uh, the danger we're in at the moment, of course, as you'll probably know, is that levels of carbon dioxide, methane, and, you know, as I say, all the other gases that act in that way in our atmosphere has been going up um, disturbingly rapidly, and the atmosphere is uh, being warmed as a result. Uh, and that's something we have to be extraordinarily mindful of, because, as I say, we don't have an infinite supply to muck around with. Uh, in this way. So we need to take care. But now the other thing associated not only with this but also the fact, as I say, that we have this near circular orbit and that it's an orbit at this sort of distance from our sort of star um, is that we have water available across the Earth's surface, not over all of it but all the way around, um, uh, all the year round. It's not all locked up at one phase of the year into ice as the Earth drifts further away from the, from the Sun and then melted again as we come closer in uh, on our orbit. It actually stays as liquid water all year round. Our porridge really is just right and that's, that's vital. So this circular orbit actually has huge benefits in terms of, of, um, of life. So let's go back to an overview of our solar system again and just put some of these things into context. So although the distances are meaningless uh, from the Sun in this diagram, the, the diameters of these planets are indicative of their actual sizes. So here sits Earth. Venus is a, a little bit smaller than the Earth. Um, Mercury quite small, Mars quite small. And then we have these giant planets um, out there beyond us. But the key thing is, given the nature of our star, the Sun, uh, that at the sort of distance Earth goes round in its nearly circular orbit, we have water in its liquid state all year round. Um, and we know that life, certainly life as we know it, requires water for all its processes. Uh, every process within our bodies goes on in solution. Uh, we need 
the water within us in order for our bodies to work and the same is true of all the other uh, living um, entities on, on our planet absolutely vital it's unlikely that there is any water on Venus simply because it is so incredibly hot uh, there are enormous quantities of greenhouse gas in the um, atmosphere of Venus and so the surface temperature on that planet is prodigiously high you have to be quite a long way up into the atmosphere before you get to temperatures uh, that wouldn't simply break apart uh, the complex molecules and structures that are associated with living, uh, living entities. Um, and you may have seen in the press recently, for instance, that people have discovered in the upper layers of, of, of the atmosphere on Venus uh, signatures of molecules that may perhaps have been generated uh, by living things that are floating around uh, in the atmosphere. Um, now I have a view on that personally and uh, I think all I say at this stage is let's wait for the evidence. Uh, it's an interesting observation, it's not proof uh, that life exists there. So Earth is special then compared to Venus. Um, there's a lot of talk about water on Mars and being able to set up colonies on Mars for instance and Mars does have some water it's it's mostly locked up in the rocks and mostly in the polar regions where it's cold enough for it to spend most of its year in in solid form um, it doesn't exist in the liquid state freely across the surface of Mars there may well have been water originally when it was a young planet uh, but because of its size, its lack of, of a strong enough gravitational um, attraction, it's all vaporised and gone uh, by and large in the intervening process. Um, so that's Mars. So we have something, this is the thing referred to earlier uh, as the Goldilocks zone. We have this small band of distances so somewhere just outside the orbit of Venus through to somewhere just inside the orbit of Mars uh, where water can exist um, reliably in a liquid state. And you know, who'd have guessed it, Earth is slap bang in the middle of that, uh, of that zone. Um, too cold, further out, way too cold. Uh, and these planets, of course, don't have solid surfaces anyway. They are um, they're called gas giants for a reason. Uh, they have solid cores. Jupiter has a large solid core, but actually that's because the gas has been compressed under its own gravitational attraction. Huge pressures down there towards the centre, um, enough to compress the gas uh, into a solid state. Um, but that doesn't make it friendly uh, for, for life in the slightest. Um, some of the moons orbiting these planets, planets, Jupiter and Saturn particularly, may well have liquid water beneath the surface. And that's an interesting um, um, area for exploration later on. And absolutely no doubt in my mind there will be um, exploratory sp um, space probes sent out to uh, moons like Enceladus, for instance, um, in the um, relatively near future in order to explore that in more detail. Okay, now I've mentioned that we have a magnetic field and the magnetic field turns out to be very important. Now it's formed in much the same way that um, we would describe the operation of an electric motor or conversely a dynamo. Uh, what we've got is a solid inner core, solid because of the pressure inside the earth, um, and an outer core that is uh, a fluid. And the inner core is rotating with respect to this outer core. So think of it a little bit like the rotation that goes on um, um, in, a, in a motor or a dynamo. What this sets up, 
this relative rotation of one with respect to the other is a magnetic field. Um, and the black lines on here are sort of depicting the magnetic field lines. So, you know, if, and this is a silly thing to imagine in a sense, but if we were to imagine sprinkling iron filings on, on, on this, you know, this is the sort of pattern those iron filings would fall into. So it's behaving a little bit like a bar magnet. So we have a north pole and a south pole um, and the magnetic field that comes out around that. Now that's important because, I beg your pardon, uh, it gives us a protection, a very real and indeed vital protection against the solar wind, these energetic particles that are being shed from the sun um, all the time. And they're coming out at huge speeds. I mean, you know, we're talking in some cases a fairly decent fraction of the speed of light. And they are sufficiently energetic that were they to arrive at the surface of the earth in any numbers, living things on the planet would suffer in the same sort of way that they suffer under the effects of radiation. Uh, and as you know, if that gets beyond a certain level, it becomes fatal. Uh, it would kill off life. And in fact, it's enough even to break up uh, the key uh, chemicals, the key molecules that are constituent components of, of living things. But because they are charged particles, again, we're going back to um, how motors and dynamos work, essentially. Uh, these actually flow out um, like a current. It's a motion of charges uh, and that's all a current is. Uh, in your copper wires in your house, it's just a motion of electrons uh, through the copper. That's a current. So we have this current of charged particles coming from the sun and they are deflected by our magnetic shield and we get this sort of um, bow wave type thing here. So these charged particles basically get deflected around the earth. They don't come down and do damage to living organisms uh, on the surface. A few stray in where the magnetic field lines are nearly vertical. And there's only two places on the planet that's true. One is near the North Pole, the other is near the South Pole. Uh, and that's what gives rise to the aurora. Uh, the aurora borealis and aurora australis uh, in the south. And you can see the power then of these solar wind particles or the ones that get through that far because when they collide with oxygen and nitrogen molecules uh, in our atmosphere uh, that energy causes them to glow. Uh, it actually bashes them about fairly significantly um, and as I say the result is, is the sort of glowing colours that can be observed uh, near the poles. Now it happens that this magnetic field um, arrived, switched on as I've said there, so essentially we're just talking about when we started getting uh, the solid core rotating at a different speed to everything else in the Earth. Um, that happened about the time that first life began to appear on the Earth. So we have this shield in space against damaging solar wind which has enabled and sustained um, uh, life-friendly conditions on the surface of the planet. So the fact that we've got a magnetic field is actually vital. Um, and we can look at our neighbours, the things nearest to us in this habitable zone of the solar system uh, and get a, a measure for that. Uh, Venus um, has no magnetic field, Mars has no magnetic field. Uh, and in both cases the solar wind um, is stripping away uh, part of their atmosphere. Uh, Venus is sufficiently large that it has enough gravity to hold on to 
the majority of its its atmosphere but nevertheless the solar wind is removing some uh, all the time and penetrating of course uh, into that atmosphere towards the surface Mars likewise uh, Mars is only um, saving grace in terms of um, uh, the solar wind is that it's further away from the Earth and therefore uh, has the benefit of, of distance. But nevertheless, the surface radiation levels from the Sun uh, on Mars are actually quite significant uh, compared to the Earth. And that's, you know, something that needs to be factored in. Now, what else have we got? This molten um, core that we have um, you know, beyond the solid core at the very, very centre, uh, is acting a bit like uh, an ocean on which the crust is floating. So these jigsaw-like tectonic plates of solid crust that we stand on are actually slowly moving around, being forced to move by the convection currents um, beneath them. Um, and that's important. It's important for all sorts of reasons. Uh, one is that it renews the surface of the planet uh, and it renews it because we have new material coming up through volcanoes and um, uh, you know the sort of deep sea trenches that you see uh, imaged on TV programs and so on where stuff is bubbling up uh, through gaps in the crust. Uh, but also, of course, part and parcel of that process is that at the boundaries between plates, uh, we have these things called subduction zones. So where new material might be coming up through a volcano, somewhere uh, we've actually got a plate that's disappearing into the magma in other places. Um, and these typically give rise to um, earthquakes, for instance. So there's a big subduction zone off the coast of Japan, which explains why it suffers uh, from earthquakes as much as it does. But the process then is that it's renewing the Earth's surface. It's taking material in, it's depositing new material back on the top. So in that way, we get mountains formed, we have erosion which forms um, alluvial plains in which we can grow crops, etc, uh, etc. Et and all of that stuff is kept going in this dynamic way because we have tectonic plate movement, because we have subduction zones and because we have areas where new material is being spewed out. Uh, and you'll know that, you know, volcanic ash like the um, ash around Vesuvius, for instance, uh, is renowned for its fertility. It enables us to grow very good crops. Uh, and as that gets eroded and washed downstream, so those nutrients get deposited uh, further afield. It's actually a really important process in terms of, of um, uh, you know, life's diversity and its sustainability. Uh, it also helps to keep the temperature stable. Uh, so because we've got this churning going on, uh, we don't have, you know, a cold layer sitting over a very hot layer. Uh, it, there's actually a bit of mixing going on there, and that's quite, uh, quite important. Um, um, again, we can compare ourselves to Venus. Venus actually has tectonic plates, but because uh, the density of the planet is not the same as the Earth, it has less mass and so on. Um, there appears not to be tectonic plate movement in the same way. So there aren't subduction zones where one plate's going under the other on, um, on Venus. It doesn't have that renewal process happening. So we appear to be just the right size and made of just the right stuff, in other words, the right sort of density uh, for these things uh, to happen on a rolling basis um, to keep the surface of our planet young, as it were. Now, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned heating, and that's actually quite important. Uh, we get some of our heat energy from the sun. We've talked about that already. Uh, but actually, a lot of the heat that we, we uh, benefit from near the surface of the Earth is coming from inside it. And about half of that's coming from what's left over from the creation of the Earth. 
So it began as a really hot, indeed a molten body at one stage, as all these bits of stuff came in um, and collided with it very energetically when it was gathering up all these bits and pieces uh, left over after the sun's formation. The other half, however, and this takes us back to how beneficial it has been to be a relatively young thing within the age of the universe. Uh, the other half comes from radioactive decays. We actually have radiated uh, radiation heating going on inside the Earth. And we wouldn't have those elements, those heavier radioactive elements, were it not for the fact that we've incorporated within our planet some of that stardust from former generations of, of uh, long since exploded um, stars. So this is one example. This is just looking at uranium up here, top right of our diagram. Uh, and it's uh, progress through each of these boxes, each one of which represents a radioactive decay event, through each of these boxes over um, various timescales from fractions of a second up to uh, millions of years, uh, all the way through to lead at the bottom. Right? which is another useful heavy element that we wouldn't have um, if we weren't, um, as I say, relatively young. So at each of these stages on the way, there is energy being given out. And it's that sort of energy that is contributing, as I say, about half of the heat energy that's coming up from the, um, from the middle of the planet towards the surface and keeping us in this nice, um, relatively stable uh, situation that we find ourselves in. The variation between summer and winter temperatures is actually very small compared to what it might be if we didn't have a circular orbit, if we didn't have this sort of heating effect going on, if we didn't have a stable atmosphere and so on. Um, all of these things need to be just right uh, for these things to happen. Now, I said I'd talk about the moon. Uh, the moon is actually really quite special. Um, and it's special for all sorts of reasons, but I'm going to first talk about um, how we orbit each other, because that act will actually colour uh, what else we, uh, we think about the subject. So I'm going to switch cameras for just a little bit. Um, so that we can see a demonstration that I want to do. Um, so I'm just going to try and demonstrate using these mesh bags that I'm going to hang on a balsa wood post. This is very Heath Robinson. Um, what I mean in terms of uh, the relatively strange at least non-intuitive way uh, that uh, we orbit our star the sun. So if I've got my pins in the right place these should balance themselves um, almost I'm just going to move this one a little bit. Bit of a perfectionist, I'm afraid. I need this just right. So this is now horizontal. Or at least it was. All right, so this is representing now at the position where this string is. Uh, this is the center of mass of these two bodies, the Earth and the Moon. Okay, and the Moon, as you know, rotates around the Earth, but actually it doesn't. Both of them rotate around this point here where the string is coming down to my um, 
my balanced beam. So the Earth is moving around that point. The Moon is moving around that point. And in fact, it turns out that it's this point. This is something called the Barry Center, center of gravity, if you will. It's this point here that is orbiting around the Sun. So it's this thing that's moving around the Sun and the Earth and the Moon are rotating around it. Okay, so that gives us actually a rather interesting set of behaviours. It means basically that the Earth is being uh, pushed and pulled, it's wobbling a little bit. So it's going around in this circular orbit around the Sun, but it's actually wobbling around that circle as it goes. Uh, being pushed and pulled by the moon, as it were. Uh, and that's enough, that little bit of wobbling, the pushing and pulling turns out to be enough to influence the motion of our tectonic plates. So it may be that that's what Venus is missing. Venus is missing a moon uh, to be able to push and pull things enough to uh, form this tectonic plate motion. All right, now the moon is, is really special in this regard. So I've said already that it's the fifth largest in the solar system. This is actually one of my uh, images uh, of the moon. In fact, it's a composite of five images that I took through my telescope some time back um, when the moon was, uh, was a crescent. But anyway, that's by the by. It's the fifth largest moon in the solar system and it's only about 1.2% of the Earth's mass. So the Earth, in other words, is, is more than 80 times the mass of the Moon, which makes the Moon sound, you know, insignificant. Uh, again, this is an image from, um, I think, the International Space Station. You can see again our thin atmosphere and then beyond it, um, our Moon. OK, but um, oh, you know, before I move on, this is another wonderful, this, you remember I mentioned this, this is the probe that's going off to get material from uh, an asteroid uh, beyond the orbit of Mars. On its way, it turned its camera back and took a picture of the Earth and the Moon, uh, which I think is a rather beautiful one. So here's the Earth, here's the Moon uh, um, out here, and it's doing the same thing as those two glass paperweights uh, I showed you. So in fact, the point around which they're both orbiting uh, sits about a thousand, between thousand and two thousand kilometers below um, the Earth's surface here. Okay, so the Earth is rotating around that point as the Moon uh, also. So we have this wobbling effect going on, but this picture I think shows the relative sizes of the two things quite nicely. But that 1.2% of Earth's mass makes it the largest moon in the entire solar system in proportion to its host planet. I mean by a huge margin. So there are bigger moons out there. Titan for instance uh, is three times the mass of the moon, but it's orbiting around Saturn, which is vast. So in fact, as a percentage of Saturn's mass, uh, even Titan is, is a very, very small fraction of 1%. Um, so we have this proportionately huge moon. And it's able, therefore, to have an effect on the Earth in the way that other moons in the solar system simply cannot do uh, for their host planets. And that turns out to be really very important. There's a lot of serious consequences come from that. We see them, of course, and certainly those of us who live near the coast, we can see them twice daily uh, in the form of tides. Uh, the moon will drag the Earth's water um, to form high tides uh, twice a day. Um, and that's, you know, that's obvious as an effect of the moon, but it's, it's doing more than that. 
because it's large enough uh, to uh, move things around in terms of the earth it can stabilize uh, the earth itself so the earth spins at an angle of about 23 and a half degrees so what i mean by that is that our axis of rotation is at 23 and a half degrees to the plane of the solar system where this disk was originally rotating um, and we benefit from it because uh, as that goes around the sun that gives us uh, our seasons uh, in the year uh, and we need those and plants need those and so on to go through their processes life on earth has developed in a way uh, that requires those seasons but 23 and a half degrees is a sort of middling way so it doesn't give us seasons that are extreme it just gives us subtle variations so compare ourselves to uh, mercury for instance which is you know almost bang upright um, and actually because mercury is so small and so close to the sun uh, it's bang upright and it's got a face that's permanently fixed towards the sun much as we only see one face of the moon um, so one side of mercury is is ridiculously hot and the other side is actually quite cold it's facing space um, uranus is at the other extreme uranus is almost totally flipped over on its side its axis of rotation is 82 and a half 82.2 degrees Probably, by the way, because of an uh, extraordinarily violent um, collision in the early part of the solar system. But that's another story altogether. But much more importantly than any of that uh, is the fact that our um, spin is stable. So in other words, again, we're producing a little bit of dynamic into this our, our seasons for instance but only a little bit uh, it's against a very stable background so if we look at mars for instance right this is the planet that you know people want to settle on um, its angle of tilt varies between 10 degrees and 60 degrees in geologically speaking very short periods of time you know a million years or so um, so, you know, what was equator becomes pole uh, in a time scale that is tiny compared to the time scales required for life to develop and diversify and so on. Um, so that's extremely important. The moon is able to stabilize our spin, right? It has enough mass that we can't do a lot of wobbling around that value. Um, and it's the only moon in the solar system that is large enough as a proportion of its host planet to be able to do that. So what have we got then? If we start summarising this, we've got um, stability. Our sun is stable. Our planet itself is relatively stable because of our circular orbit, etc, etc. And then we've got a moon that stabilises us and so on. Um, so we've got water and all the rest of it. We have a magnetic field, so we're protected uh, from the damaging stuff that's coming off uh, the sun. But we have a little bit of dynamic going on. We have some dynamism. We have uh, tectonics taking place. We have seasons because of our uh, moderate tilt and so on. All of those things that actually have proven to be really quite, uh, quite useful. Um, in terms of sustaining the sort of life that we know about. So dynamic stability does seem to be a term that sort of sums up where we are uh, as an Earth, uh, as a planet rather. Um, um, and life, if we fold into all, all those factors, life is actually extraordinarily fragile against that background. Uh, we need all of this stuff to be in place simultaneously to be where we are um, now today. Um, were those things not in place? Who knows? So let's look at 
exoplanets. Let's look at uh, what is now a list of many hundreds uh, of planetary systems and planets within those systems uh, elsewhere in our galaxy. Uh, and that's just in our galaxy. Remember, there, there are you know there are another trillion galaxies beyond our own, so the numbers multiply up. But we can't see, of course, uh, into uh, the individual stars and their planetary systems in other galaxies. We can only look in detail at our own. Um, so we're going to look at uh, zones. I mean, this one's just called Just Right, all right? So this is the whole water existing uh, on the surface of the planet thing. Uh, this is the mass, and again, this is another one of those um, logarithmic scales that I talked about. So here's Earth, and Earth is defined as one on this scale. So Mars is only just a little bit more than a tenth of Earth's mass. It's really quite tiny compared to the Earth. So it sits up here. Um, Venus is a little bit less massive than the Earth. It's up a little bit, but, but not by a huge amount. Uh, the only, there is only one other planet that sort of sits vaguely in our vicinity in terms of mass. It's this one here. Um, there are others out here of the same mass, but they're orbiting very close to their star. So they will be incredibly hot, far hotter for instance, than Venus, hotter even than Mercury in most cases. So this vast collection of planets that have been observed around other stars uh, is way too hot uh, for liquid water to be present and therefore to have life in, in, in a form that we understand. Uh, and we go further out, of course, and, and these places are too cold. So, you know, this is this is a sort of distance where um, Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune uh, reside, for instance. Um, but we have to look at the mass as well. Right? Mass and size uh, in general has been important. Remember, we need enough to hang on to an atmosphere. Uh, we need to be about right for tectonic plates, for magnetic fields to arise, that sort of stuff. All of that stuff needs to be in place. But also, of course, it determines how much uh, uh, the strength of gravity associated with that planet. Make it more massive and the strength of gravity goes up. Uh, and so what you can do in terms of, of surviving as a life form uh, will change accordingly. Uh, it doesn't mean it couldn't exist, it just means that it will be very, very different. And you'll notice, and remember this is a logarithmic scale, so just going from here to here, we're going up uh, a factor of 10. So the, this planet down here, for instance, is 10 times the mass of the Earth. Um, and you'll notice there's a lot around here uh, in this more massive region, and then more massive still further on. So, as I was saying earlier, if you, if you want all of the factors to be together that has enabled life not only to uh, begin on Earth, but to develop, to diversify, to be sustained, if you want all of those factors to be in place, then actually the Earth is, is pretty unusual uh, in the scheme of things. Uh, it makes this place really rather special and something to be valued and cherished and looked after. Um, I'm putting this in just to show you a bit of evidence uh, for exoplanets. People have, have detected them around stars mostly by looking at the fact that if a planet passes in front of a star it cuts off some of the light that that star um, is able to send in our direction. So of course this all relies on, on, on the planets, you know, orbiting the star so that they will be, be between us and the star. So we're only seeing a fraction of what's out there, in other words. Um, it's only very, very recently that we've been able to provide something close to the image of a planet that's not in our solar system. 
and this is the best that we've got so far um, and it looks fuzzy and blurred well you know given the distances involved in getting this image I think we're gonna have to cut them some slack on this what they've done is to block out the light that's coming from the central star because otherwise that would just dominate the whole thing and then they've tried to give us an image of the light coming from material around so this is light coming from a part of that disk of leftover stuff uh, that's rotating around the star after the star has, has switched on and it's out of that remaining stuff that leftover bits and pieces uh, that planets will form and here look this bright spot uh, is an early planet forming out of this disk of stuff around the star. Now this is nothing like an Earth type planet, this is something that's actually larger than Jupiter and closer, far closer in to its star than we are to the Sun. So you know this is this is never going to be a planet that will sustain uh, water and therefore a form of life that we would be able to recognize. Um, it's probably a sterile planet in other words but nevertheless this is the first visual detection uh, of a planet um, beyond our stellar system. So that's it we're at the end uh, we're back to our opening um, slide and thank you from planet Earth. Well this is just a bit of a bonus feature for those of you who have the stamina uh, for a little bit more. Um, some fun calculations really. Um, we know the earth rotates once a day and in fact a day is not precisely 24 hours it's a little bit short of 24 hours as you can see. So we can work out a speed at the surface of a planet. Now for those of you who remember back that far, um, we're going to need a little bit of trigonometry for that. Don't worry about it too much, I will just tell you what comes out of those calculations. Canterbury has a latitude of 51.3 degrees north for instance. Um, so you know we're up here somewhere actually, not where this diagram is drawing it. Uh, but that means that at Canterbury we have a speed as we rotate around the axis of, of the Earth of about 288 meters per second, so less than at the equator which would be 460. So we're traveling at, you know, if we put it in, in, in our old um, units at 644 miles per hour um, as the planet spins, but uh, we're orbiting the Sun and remember it's not the center of the Earth orbiting the Sun, it's this thing I called the Barry Center, it's the center of uh, uh, mass between the Earth and the Moon. Um, it's orbiting the Sun at about 30,000 meters per second, so 30 kilometers per second. Um, and the Sun itself is rotating, remember rotation was one of our watchwords, the Sun itself is rotating around the center of the Milky Way and it's doing that at prodigious speed, so 220 kilometers per second. Um, so you know in miles per hour ridiculous sum, almost half a million miles per hour uh, as we go around um, uh, the center of the Milky, Milky Way. Now one of the other things you will have perhaps heard about in the past uh, is satellites using something called a slingshot in order to gain speed. And in fact Voyager, both the Voyager probes, uh, I mentioned Voyager 1 way back near the beginning, uh, picked up a lot of speed by doing exactly that. So they pass close to a body within the solar system, a planet will do, uh, and quite often it will be the Earth in fact. Uh, they'll go out and then they'll come back really close and spin round. And if they do that in the same direction as our rotation 
they actually pick up a bit of energy from the earth that's what gives them a kick and builds up their speeds the link between the two the sort of slingshot tie if you will uh, is just the gravitational attraction between the two so it picks up the satellite and flicks it round as the earth rotates underneath it um, and of course the earth is going around the sun so you can play all these games and, and pick up energy um, from uh, what is to a satellite an absolutely enormously massive body but of course if we give energy to a satellite we lose it right? it's, an, it's a zero-sum game here so we've speeded up satellites like Voyager but in the process we have slowed ourselves down um, now the difference in mass between the two means that you know the day has not got measurably longer um, you'd need you know a really good clock we're talking about the level of atomic clocks here in order to be able to measure anything discernible even if we did this thousands of times over uh, but it is nevertheless true we slow down every time we speed our satellite up now it turns out that the moon is also speeding up uh, it's getting faster as it's going around us um, and in the process is moving further away uh, and it's quite measurable I mean it's moving away you know of the order of, of centimeters a decade um, in the distant past if we could travel back in a time machine um, you know we would see a much larger brighter moon in the sky because it would have been a lot closer than it is now uh, that's all to do with the way the moon was formed I mean it was formed when earth was hit by another um, body from the early parts of the solar system something probably approaching the size of Mars in fact so this was a huge collision uh, ended up melting both of them uh, and they mixed a bit but wobbled enough that a glob of material was thrown off and that actually is what ended up cooling down and becoming the moon but it's still moving away from us um, whereas our nearest galaxy the nearest galaxy to the Milky Way uh, Andromeda is actually moving nearer to us it's actually coming towards us at as it says on the slide uh, about 400,000 kilometers per hour um, but you know don't worry we've got many many millions of years before uh, before it gets here uh, and even then you know we're not talking about violent collisions we're talking about the two galaxies merging uh, into a single much larger galaxy now I talked about the earth losing material into space is it, it's actually losing some um, from the atmosphere every day so uh, you know it's a few hundred tons um, you know on, a, on a, an annual basis but we're actually gaining more we're gaining stuff um, about 43 tons a day from debris so from bits of asteroid which you know appear to us in the sky as, as meteors of course uh, from you know the stuff that's left behind by comets as they go past uh, and indeed from from particles that come uh, from the Sun uh, and in fact they all come down and settle on the earth you have probably literally uh, hoovered up some of this material uh, as you've done your house cleaning uh, as we've gone through um, but you know as I also said we have enough gravity on the earth to hang on to our atmosphere pretty effectively uh, and you know the Sun's going to expand and, and move into its dying phases uh, and obliterate the inner planets at least long before our atmosphere disappears so um, if you're going to worry about something don't make it that and that really is the end so thank you again